Welcome to Polar Bear International's Tundra Connections program. It's polar bear season in Churchill and we are coming to you live from the Tundra Buggy One on the shores of the Hudson Bay with Arctic winds and polar bears just outside these windows. My name is Terry Godwaltz and I'm the Director of Programming for the Centre for Global Education and we are honoured to be alongside you here today with our partners PBI who are hosting this event for the world and taking it global as well who is supporting and bringing in their audience to join us today. Today we are learning about Canada's icon. Our target audience is classrooms and people just like yourself all across North America and around the world. Our partners for today's program are Explore.org and members of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums that are the Arctic Ambassadors Centre. This program will last about 45 minutes, including the time for questions and answers. Now, in addition to learning about our icons, we'll also talk about what you can do to help save our polar bears and our planet. And we'd love to hear about what you are doing as well to conserve and to make those actions that are so very necessary. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you are not just watching us on the computer. We want you to be an active part of this webcast that's coming out for you today. We want you, as you are looking at us, and we are right out here in the middle of the Canadian tundra, to reach in and to share your comments and share your questions. So we know we have the chat window that's on the side of the stream. We'd invite you to send questions to questions at pbears.org. And lastly, we'd invite you to use Twitter at hashtag Tundra Connections and we will share those questions and those comments throughout the webcast for today. Now as you can see I'm not the only one who's here and I'd like to introduce you to our panel of guests who are here. So across the table from me here today we have Dr. Stefan Peterson. Stefan over to you. Hello uh, welcome everyone my name is Stefan Peterson I'm the head of conservation and research at Assiniboine Park Zoo which is in Winnipeg um, and we our uh, zoological facility, but we also have a pretty active research program. So my background, uh, I've studied everything from fleas and tarantulas all the way up the, in size to polar bears and, and bowhead whales even. So in the spring, I'm usually up here studying harbor seals and ring seals, and I've got this super opportunity to come up and, and study and, and communicate about polar bears, which is why we're here today. Welcome, Stefan. It's great to have you here. And sitting beside Stefan, we have Alyssa McCall. Alyssa? Hi, everyone. My name is Alyssa McCall, and I work for Polar Bears International. Right now, I'm based out of Edmonton, Alberta, where I did my master's research at the University of Alberta. So this is my fifth bear season in Churchill, Manitoba, and I've studied uh, these polar bears that are right outside our window right now. And it's just really great to be here today and telling you about polar bears and just what's going on with Canadian polar bears. We're happy to be here. Thank you so very much, Elisa. And beside Elisa, we have Dr. Jennifer Kay. Jen? Yeah, hello. My name is Jen Kay, and I'm a professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, I'm really excited to be a part of this webcast. I study sea ice and clouds. And this week, actually, we had a paper accepted where I'm working with scientists from around the world, including scientists from Canada. <gasps> looking at future sea ice trends. So it's definitely an international thing, being a scientist in Canada is definitely a part of that. Thank you so very much, Jen, and thank you to our entire panelists for being here today. Now, you've met us, we would also like you to, we would like to introduce to you the place where we happen to be. So Jen, I'm gonna pass the microphone back to you and tell us where are we joining these people from? Yeah, so I started my journey from Colorado, flew up to Winnipeg, met Stefan in the airport. We hopped on Calm Air and took that flight up to Churchill, Manitoba, which is the polar bear capital of the world. And this time of year, there's about as many people as polar bears, about 900. So why are all these polar bears here on the tundra? They're waiting for the sea ice to come in, and so that's why they're here hanging out. And how did we get here? And how do we stay safe from the polar bears? Uh, we're on a tundra buggy. So think a monster truck with a school bus on top. And uh, ours in particular is outfitted as a mobile broadcast studio so that you all can learn about polar bears and we can share what we're seeing up here with you. Mm, okay, so we've met our guests. We've met a little bit of where we are in the planet. Let's talk about this icon that we are going to be looking about and hearing about today. So, how many polar bears are there in all of Canada? Elisa? Sure. Well, 
First of all, worldwide, there's about 20 to 25,000 polar bears, we think. It's pretty hard to get a good estimate. But we know that Canada has about two-thirds of the entire world's population of polar bears. So Canada has about 15,000 polar bears. And, you know, it's just so amazing to be in Churchill because we call Churchill the polar bear capital of the world. So the bears are here right now because they're waiting for the sea ice to form in Hudson Bay. And so that allows us to get close and watch these polar bears. And I just, it's so neat to talk to the people that come up here. A lot of tourists come up in the fall to see the polar bear. A lot of people have it on their bucket list. And this is the place that they want to be because growing up as kids in Canada, we hear a lot about the mm -hmm. polar bear. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of all around us. And I remember learning a poem about the polar bear in my grade three class in British Columbia, you know, on the shores of Churchill, on the shores of Hudson Bay in Churchill. And it's just so cool to actually be here and be surrounded by the bears. It's really neat. I think you're right. It's part of all of our lives, especially mm -hmm. myself as a Canadian as well. You can't, it's, it's, it's part of everything that we do. Uh, and to tell us some more about how their connection is to their, their lives, I'll pass it over to Stefan. Yeah. I, I work in a zoological facility and we have polar bears and we have a long history of having polar bears and people really connect with those animals. I, I know of instances that people have wanted to be married in front of polar bears <laughs> as, uh, as witnesses to their, <laughs> to their union as it were and, and people that, you know, maybe they can't get up to Churchill, we, we hope and we encourage them to really see polar bears in the wild but sometimes people can't get, and they really form this bond, this personal relationship with, with this iconic species. Um, and that can be quite powerful. We can use that to try and communicate messages about climate change, um, about habitat loss, all sorts of messages through this, you know, a, of, a piece of our, um, our, all our national identity almost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, St Stefan, are there other animals that you would say that also are iconic for Canadians besides just the polar bears? I think so. I, I mean, I could list all my favorite animals, <laughs> and they should be everyone's as well. <laughs> but I think a, a narwhal as a as a iconic, maybe not as commonly known, but certainly, um, I don't know. I think it should be. There's a lot of Arctic species because they're so. Um, so the North is such a big part of, of Canadian identity um, mm -hmm. that the species that are in the North also take on a piece, of, uh, a piece of everyone in Canada. And not just Canada, I think throughout the world there's mm -hmm. people that make these connections to these amazing species. But we could probably all have a list of, of what we think are the major or the, the icons of Canada. Absolutely. What about you, Lisa? What would be some other animals that you would have on your list of, of, of iconic Canadian um, uh, species? Sure. I, th I think part of the reason Canadians maybe like polar bears is just because they're such this hardy animal that deals with the cold so well. You know, they're very charismatic. Maybe we like to think of ourselves like that. But we have some other animals that maybe we don't necessarily see ourselves in, but they were just so important to Canada. And one really good example is the beaver. Mm. So mm -hmm. a lot of the reason that Canada got settled and turned into this great country that it is is because of the beaver and the fur trade and people selling beaver pelts. So, you know, hundreds of years ago, you could get uh, two and a quarter kilograms of sugar for a beaver pelt, and that was quite a big deal. Uh, you could also trade 12 beaver pelts in to get a gun, which would have helped you, you know, a lot for hunting. So beavers were really this mm -hmm. main trade animal, mm -hmm. and I think that's actually our official iconic species. You know, they're very hardworking, very important to our history. I think maybe people think the polar bear might be a little cuter, maybe slightly less, you know, annoying. Uh, <laughs> some people think the beaver's annoying. I think they're pretty darn cool. Um, an another Canadian animal that I think a lot of us can identify with is the loon. So how many of you have gone camping before and you're on a lake falling asleep and you hear the call of the loon and it's such a beautiful thing. So beautiful. And the loon is actually even on our $1 coin, so our mm -hmm. loonie in Canada. And that's a pretty neat thing. But then to get back into polar bears, the, the polar bear is on our $2 coin and we <laughs> call it our toonie. And there, there's a polar bear on it who's on the shores of the, the ocean somewhere. And actually, the mint named this polar bear Churchill. <laughs> so after this area here, which is kind of cool. So if, if any of you that aren't from Canada ever come across a $2 coin, check it out, and you'll see a polar bear on there. 
Okay, so if we're talking about some people would like to reduce everything down to economics, and we talk now that we're talking about it on the on on the coin, right? It's uh, the polar bear is actually on our two dollar coin. Um, would there be any if you wanted to quantify the value of the an animal? What would what would it be? So it's really really tough to quantify an animal, but actually someone tried in 2011, there was a report commissioned by uh, the Canadian government to look at how much is a polar bear actually worth to Canadians. And it came up with some pretty interesting numbers. Uh, so they found out that households in Canada would be willing to pay $508 per home to help polar bears. That's to keep polar bears in Canada. And that's quite a bit of money per home. And that works out to about $420,000 per polar bear. And people are really, you know, willing to put the dollars down to help polar bears. And you know, they they are say they they're willing. Um, and I don't think it's actually going to cost that much money to to help polar bears. We can all do these actions uh, that actually mm -hmm. save our households money and also uh, help the polar bears. And we'll talk more about that. But we really don't need to be each spending, you know, five hundred dollars. We can save money and save the polar bears at the same time. So. Um, Absolutely. They have a value that goes so much beyond what any monetary, yes. but it is, you're right, it's really interesting to see that. It is. And I mean, there's such an important part and have so much value to us that we don't want to, when there are circumstances where we have polar bears in our zoos and working with a zoo, would you be able to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I, I'd i like to go back to something Elisa said about, and uh, you, that about monetizing mm -hmm. natural species or ecosystems. And there's a lot of discussion about that on whether we should be even putting a price because when we put a price on things then we know how much we're willing to lose it and so we should be looking at these things as we're all connected and it's all um, one big ecosystem and if we do put a price and then we lose it then we're all losing something inherently so we should be uh, some philosophy uh, philosophizers, I guess, it would be uh, urging us not to treat animals or give them a dollar sign or, or monetize a species because then we think of it as something that can be bought and sold. And we should be thinking of it more holistically and much more like many First Nations and Inuit think of it as uh, a, a piece of the ecosystem that includes humans mm -hmm. in a very meaningful way. Absolutely, yeah, so. and that, that in the report they mentioned that that dollar sign did not take into account just the intrinsic value of you know artistic, holistic, traditional um, values that people have with the polar bear, and it's just, it's, they're really priceless. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we don't want to go assigning dollar yeah. signs to everything, yeah. for sure, <laughs> even though uh, tourism is you know a big deal in Churchill, part of the Churchill economy, um, a lot of people come here and you know it's not necessarily cheap to fly up to the subarctic and see polar bears but people do that every year and it, it would definitely hit the Churchill economy if polar bears disappeared but it would be just much more tragic I think mm -hmm. on a bigger mm -hmm. scale if polar bears disappeared um, yeah for all Canadians not just Churchillians and ladies and gentlemen, we have some great questions that are coming in. MK, we're going to come to those questions in a little bit. Samantha Foley and Caitlin Fraser, thank you for posting those questions on Twitter. We're going to grab those here right away. Uh, before we do that, though, let's talk a little bit more. We're going to go straight down the line here about um, why, because they are at risk. Um, why are you afraid of losing them? So, Jen, um, can you explain why, what's happening that we're afraid of losing the polar bears? Sure, Terry. So what's going on is we're losing the Arctic sea ice and polar bears use sea ice as a platform to hunt seals. So to give you a sense of how dramatic that loss has been, satellites started taking data that showed the sea ice cover over the entire Arctic about the time I was born in the late 1970s. And since then, the sea ice has declined and actually 2012, which was the lowest sea ice on record, there was half of the sea ice from when I was born in September. So that is a huge change and uh, it's just really something that affects the polar bears and going into the future, if we do the same business as usual, you know, continue to emit greenhouse gases, not, not curb our emissions, I think the future for polar bears does look pretty bleak. But it is something that we control, and so into the future, if we can reduce greenhouse gases, we will be able to get the sea ice back. And I see BJ has brought up just a map showing the uh, 2012 uh, 
September sea ice, and you just see, this is the lowest sea ice extent on record. You see the open water north of Canada, Hudson Bay, totally ice-free, but so is the Northwest Passage. You could circumnavigate the North Pole. This is not the kind of thing that you could do when I was born. Hmm. Wow. And uh, Alisa, what about you? Uh, so um, I can speak to the Canadian polar bear populations, at least in Hudson Bay. Uh, we are seeing changes in the populations here that are based on the sea ice patterns. So we have this really long data set of both sea ice patterns, climate data, and polar bear data, and that makes us able to link those together because we have to look at climate on a very long scale, and we have to look at those types of trends on a long scale. And lucky for us, polar bear research started in this area in 1980, so we have this fantastic data set. And what we've seen uh, from 1980 till now is that the sea ice is actually around for three to four weeks less than it used to be. So we have less sea ice now. Uh, it's around here for uh, fewer weeks, and that means that polar bears have fewer weeks to hunt. So they're catching fewer seals and consuming fewer calories. Mm -hmm. And so over a long period of time, this impacts a population of animals. And we've seen this population has declined over the last 40 years. Uh, we've seen them having fewer cubs. The bears are a little bit smaller than they used to be. And uh, all of our models that we have into the future show that this trend is going to continue unless we take action now, which we absolutely can do. So if we keep the sea ice here as it is, we're going to keep polar bears here and polar bears in Churchill and on Hudson Bay. Uh, as the climate models show, if we continue, Hudson Bay is going to be sea ice free by about 2050. And so that means that in about 30 years, we're not going to have polar bears around here uh, like we do now. And we don't want to see that happen. So as we're talking about sea ice, there's a great question here from uh, MK who says, "Is what do polar spend their t polar bears spend their time doing while they're waiting for the for the uh, sea ice to form?" That's a great question. So really, they spend their time doing a lot of not much, um, <laughs> especially in the summer. So they come off the sea ice in July, and it you know it really warms up in July and August, and polar bears. They've got a lot of fat, they've got a lot of fur, and they can overheat very quickly. And so what they do is a lot of them kind of dig day beds and they sleep a lot. They might walk a little bit, but not. they don't do a whole lot. They're conserving their energy so they're not burning through their fat stores because they're not going to eat a good meal for another four months. Some of them will try to scavenge. Uh, there are bears that eat geese and goose eggs and kelp and berries. Of course, they're bears. They want to always eat but they're not getting the calories from land that they do on the sea ice. Now, right now, they're still on land. The sea ice isn't back, but the temperatures have cooled right down. We've got some snow out there, and we can tell that the ice is going to show up fairly soon. And we kind of see the bears maybe perk up a little bit. So we are seeing some more activity. They're not going to overheat, so we're seeing a lot of more play. We're seeing mm -hmm. some sparring. We're seeing a lot more movement of bears. We've seen a couple bears running, which is kind of strange, but for some reason they're, you know, maybe, I don't know what they're doing, but it's been really interesting to watch and we're really lucky to be here and see what's happening and we're, you know, excited for them to get back out on the sea ice hopefully in the next couple weeks here. Absolutely. So we're talking about icons and we're talking about the north and about the polar bear. Now, if what do you think the polar bear has become this poster child in the Arctic affected by climate change? And this is a question by MK. Why do you think it's become this poster child or this icon? Um, as opposed to another Arctic species. So, um, Stefan, you were talking, and, I mean, be working in zoos, you work with many different animals. Yeah. Um, why do you think it's what makes them so special, as opposed to the Arctic fox was one that, uh, that MK talked about, or the wolf or the beluga whale? Yeah, it's a really great question, and I don't think, I don't think there's a definitive answer. I know that charismatic megafauna are used quite commonly as umbrella species to really represent and protect an entire ecosystem. So you can think about grizzly bears in the, in the Cascades and the Rockies. We might, be able, might not be able to really protect um, every individual species, but if you protect and really get the habitat for the big species that range over large ecosystems like grizzly bears or polar bears, then you have a lot of species that fall into that and are definitely protected as well. Mm -hmm. So they're a way of encompassing a whole ecosystem, but they're also awesome. They're really, <laughs> really awesome. And, and people, for all the bear species, lots of people 
really are drawn to those that that species. I mean, carnivores in general, people really like, but especially the the big ones, the lions, the tigers, um, the polar bears. They're all, for some reason, humans really connect with with those animals. But that's not to say they're the only ones that that are important. You mentioned beluga. A lot of people do connect with belugas, or I think of uh, killer whales. So in the Pacific coast, there's lots of uh, traditional ecological knowledge and legend around killer whales, and mm -hmm. in many um, uh, groups throughout the world. But they could be another one where if you protect killer whales, you're protecting an entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I think uh, my supervisor at my university, Andy DeRoche, he had a good line. Uh, you know, there's a lot of species that are at risk from the sea ice, and so we use polar bears to kind of represent that. But another species that might be at risk is the polar cod. But if there is a, a polar cod international, would you guys be tuning in to watch us right now? I don't know. Uh, so the polar bear is a really good symbol that gets people interested. Absolutely. Those are great questions, MK. And I just want to throw it out again to all of our listening audience who is there. Uh, we want you to be a part of this debate. We want you to be a part of this conversation. So whether you're sharing your comments and your thoughts through the hashtag Tundra Connections, whether you're going on and you're posting your questions through the chat box that's on the side, just beside where we have the stream, or you're going on to our email account that's there, we would encourage all of you, which is at questions at pbears.org. We want to have you as part of this debate. We want to bring you in with us to the beautiful subarctic that you see mm -hmm. out there and uh, to, to have you, um, yeah, to enter into a conversation with us as we're going. Now we've talked a little bit about um, the different animals that are out there that might be icons. Um, let's pass it back over to Stefan again to talk about the role that zoos would play for these different animals. Yeah. So that's a, a really key role for zoos, and the role of zoos has changed over time, and one of the big roles we have now is conserving animals in the wild. So how do we go about doing that? And one of the key kind of mechanisms is trying to make that connection for people between animals and their environment. So the animal that they get a chance to see in a zoological facility connecting that to the things that they're doing in their life um, and and really because they have this personal connection to an individual making them think about the whole species and the population and the ecosystem that it lives in and so we not all, we can't really in zoos just assume that that's going to happen so many zoos including my own are looking at our visitors and doing research on our visitors to find out are they learning about polar bears? Are they learning about climate change? And then are they turning that into actions that will keep polar bears uh, in the wild all the time? Yeah. Absolutely. So I think many people are, are wanting to know, yes, we care deeply about the polars and we care deeply about these different iconic species that are up there living in the north. We want to understand maybe more why. Why are we losing this climate? Why are we losing this ice and what's contributing to that? As a climatologist, Jen, can you fill us in a little bit more on that front? Yeah, so I think it's important when you talk about why sea ice is going away to bring in the factors that are controlling the loss. So when you look on long time scales, on climate time scales, we would not be seeing the sea ice loss that we're seeing if we weren't emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. It's one of these early signatures of climate change. Climate models that were run, you know, in the early 1980s, they, they projected that we would lose sea ice and the Arctic would warm first. And here we are, you know, 2014, lo and behold, it's the sixth lowest on the satellite record. And we're, we're seeing that sea ice loss. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a pretty easy detective case in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, another thing I think that's really important is discriminating between weather and climate. So, you know, just because the sea ice goes up one year or down one year, that's that's not what we're looking at as an indication mm -hmm. of climate change. We're looking at the long-term records, what's happened over the last 30 years. And it's really neat to be able to tie that to polar bears and understand what's going on with them here. Absolutely, and I'll tell you, the questions are coming in about the polar bears. So Samantha Foley and Caitlin Fraser have both asked, if polar bears live so far north, where it is so cold, do they hibernate at any point in the winter? That Alisa. is a great question. 
So polar bears actually do not hibernate. So grizzly bears and black bears do, but polar bears don't. Uh, we used to call their time on land a walking hibernation, and now that we know that might not be the best term to call it, but they do really slow down in the summer. But you know, they don't go into dens and they don't fall asleep for that time period where there's low food, like other bears would. Pregnant females do go into their maternity dens, and they do kind of slow down and they won't defecate and things like things like that, you know, getting prepared to have their baby. Uh, but that's not even technically hibernation uh, based on how we define hibernation. So they really are kind of special like that. Stefan, do you have anything to add to that? Or? Yeah, no, I agree completely. Yeah, they're, 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 they're There's a number of ways to conserve energy. So mm -hmm. um, bears that are in maybe not the best shape will dig like short-term dens Mm -hmm. But really, it's just those females, sometimes. yeah, right. that are are in the dens for a long period of time. Right. We did see a, a bear a couple of days ago dig himself a little snow bed mm -hmm. and just kind of plop down on it, mm -hmm. and he he looked pretty tired. I think he probably slept there for a while, but uh, not you know he doesn't have a little cave to go into and wait for the ice. And he must be tired. I mean, yeah. I was shocked to learn this that they during the summer months they hardly eat. And so how long would that period go, and then what would these bears eat in that time that they don't have the ice on? At least sure, then. so these polar bears will come off the ice in about July, and of course they won't get out until the ice until at least mid to late November. Uh, so, you know, that's a solid four months where they don't really have a lot of food. Now, they are bears, and they, they do like to eat, so they are finding geese and goose eggs. Uh, once in a while, maybe a caribou carcass or something that washes up on shore, a lot of berries, things like that. But those terrestrial food sources really don't have the calories or the fat that polar bears depend on uh, for their body size. So polar bears are the most carnivorous of bears, and some scientists even like to call them lipovores because of that, you know, needing that fat. Whereas the grizzly and black bears are really the omnivores, and they can eat different sorts of things. And so pregnant females, they don't eat till for up to eight months because, of course, right now they're in their dens and they're not going to go out onto the sea ice when it comes in. They have to wait to have their babies in another month or two, and then they won't take their babies out to the sea ice until about late February or early March. Okay, so just a second. A long How time. long did you say those mothers were going <laughs> yeah. for? Up to eight months without eating. Eight Can you imagine? Months. That's, that's I, a long time. If my lunch is an hour <laughs> late, I'm suffering. Right? But seriously, these guys yeah. will go another three months. We've been months. snacking all day oh here, but yeah, these guys, gracious. they're going for a long time. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, so we have another question here from MK. Thanks for keep, uh, for uh, continue to send those in. And I'll throw this back to our climate scientist. Um, does the loss of sea ice somehow affect the rest of the Earth? That's a great question, because it's not just about the polar bears, right? I mean, climate change affects us all, and so how does the lack of sea ice and the loss of sea ice affect the rest of the Earth? Jen? Yeah, so before we get into how sea ice does affect the earth, I want to give one misconception and just clarify that right up front. Right. So when you melt sea ice, you do not raise sea level. So mm -hmm. it's just like the you know ice cubes in your glass. When it melts, it's already floating in the glass, so it's not going to displace any water. So you have to melt something like Greenland or Antarctica, land-based ice, um, in order to see mm. sea level rise. But the loss of sea ice does affect uh, the climate system, and we know there's a lot of uh, positive feedbacks or sort of amplifiers that exist in the Arctic climate. And so when you lose sea ice, often you're replacing it with a very dark surface that can absorb a lot more of the incoming sunshine. And so when you do that, you absorb more heat into the system, and that amplifies the warming. So sometimes called the surface albedo feedback. Uh, oh, good. I think I have a t-shirt that says that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Nice. So nice. Kate, Caitlin has a great question here is, how long have polar bears been endangered and how can we prevent them from going extinct? Isn't that the question, you know? How can we all, we all want to learn, but we also all want to be a part of the solution that's there. So how long have they been endangered, and then what can we do to help them not become extinct? Yeah, I can take that, and then maybe Alyssa can help mm -hmm. out. Sure. So one of the first things that we should clear up is they're not considered endangered. Mm -hmm. So each um, jurisdiction has a different classification. So in the States, they're threatened. In Canada, they're a species of special concern. But there's nowhere that said they're endangered. So that's one thing. There's many species that have way fewer individuals. 
um, than polar bears, but we're very concerned that as they lose their habitat, like so many other species, when they lose that habitat, we're going to see big reductions in polar bears. And we don't want them to get to the point where they are endangered. And then, I've forgotten what the second part of the question is. Well, the second part, we'll throw this over to Elisa, because sure. she's going to be yeah. the expert. What can we do? Mm. Sure. There are a lot of things we can do. So I mentioned before that, you know, Canada tried to put a price on polar bears to save them, but actually we can save ourselves money and save polar bears at the same time. So a lot of things that make a big difference are things that will reduce the greenhouse gas emissions or reduce our carbon footprint. And those are just really simple things like if you can drive your car less, if you can walk more or bike more, if you can turn off your lights when you don't need them on, uh, when you're leaving the room, just flip that switch. Um, you know, turning down your thermostat. I know winter's coming in Canada, it's going to be a bit chilly, but how about we get some really warm slippers and a sweater to put on and keep the thermostat at a reasonable level. You know, all these little things, they, they take less energy and so they're burning fewer fossil fuels mm -hmm. and that's really going to help the environment not warm as quickly, letting the sea ice stick around longer and letting polar bears stick around. So those are just taking these little actions really scale up if we can all do our part. And really we know, I mean, there's, there's, there is less funding that's going around now in terms of polar bear research and that PBI, Polar Bears International, um, has funding research as a high priority. So also contributing to groups like PBI that are doing the research and helping make uh, this knowledge known and apparent out there as I think is a really important part. Okay, so we know the habitat is changing and Outdoor Eddie has a great question here in terms of how are polar bears adapting to the changes they see in their habitat now. So what do we see? How are they changing? Sure, well the thing with polar bears, well first of all adaptation um, in scientific terms, you know, it takes a very, very long time for a species to adapt to something. And polar bears are long-lived organisms that have slow reproductive cycles. And so by the time we would see any evolution or adaptation of polar bears, you'd have to have a human living for thousands of years to actually witness that. It, it just happens over these very long life cycles, very long, you know, tens of thousands of years. And we are changing their environment in decades. And so it's just too quickly for these organisms to adapt. Individual polar bears, you know, might come up with some, uh, you know, different strategies. So there are some polar bears that might, you know, switch um, eating a little bit more of a certain prey type that's more available, moving a different distance, uh, you know, instead of coming ashore here, they might try to go down to Ontario where the ice kind of sticks around a little bit longer. But none of those things are actually showing us evidence of adaptation to different temperatures and different sea ice conditions um, because that will just take, uh, you know, thousands of years to happen and mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. that's just not going to happen uh, in time. So we really need to, you know, change what's happening with our climate because polar bears won't be able to, you know, fix it for themselves. Great. Thanks so much, Outdoor Eddie, for that great question. Mm -hmm. Now let's go across to Anna G.A., who's joining us via the chat on explore.org. And Anne's question is, is the ice freezing enough now for the polar bears to go out on the ice? And if not, how much lo more time do you think they'll need before they're able to go out? Pass it over to you, Stefan. Yeah, so there's a lot of variability every year about when the ice forms. We're starting to see a little bit of uh, ice form along the shores. Um, and a lot of the bears that we've been seeing since that's kind of happened or a little bit further away from where we are on land and out in the, on the pack ice there. But the, the bay itself usually doesn't freeze until further into November, sometimes into December. So it really depends on kind of the number of storms, how choppy the waves are, how cold the temperatures get. That's gonna dictate when it's actually forming this particular year. Over the long term, we know that that's been pushed a little bit later um, over the last few decades. So it's really those long term trends that are the worrisome, even though you know this might be a good year or a bad year and the next year, we just can't stack up too many bad years in mm. a row mm -hmm. yep, without absolutely. having some implications. Yep, yeah, for sure. I love this question here from Jonathan. Oh, first off, thanks, Anne. That was a great question, uh, uh, posting that on explore.org. Let's go to Jonathan's question here. Are polar bears iconic to native peoples as well? Great question. That's an, I'm not sure who wants yeah. to take that one. Yeah. That. <laughs> go ahead, Stefan. Yeah, we, we haven't really talked very much about it, but really, even before 
any of us or any of our ancestors were on the continent. Polar bears were important to Inuit, to Inuvialuit, to many um, mm -hmm. in Manitoba, Northern Cree and Dene people. They all have really unique relationships with, um, with polar bears. And being of European ancestry, I'm probably not the best person to talk about it, but the, the, the relationship between nature and, and iconic species like polar bears is a much more um, closely tied together, both in their mythologies, in their, in their legends, in how they think about and treat uh, polar bears in terms of the respect. It's all quite different than what kind of Europeans um, think of and, and how we perceive and how we uh, internalize and make polar bears special. Everyone uh, puts a definitely a high value on them, but those are, are speak differently to different groups and yeah. Mm, thank you so much for that. We got a, a question just coming online here from Carol Bear, who's posted this one on explore.org. Do you ever study just the cubs and the mums? <laughs> uh, there are studies that look at cubs and mums specifically. So, cubs and mums actually can tell us a lot about how the population is doing. It can tell us about recruitment to the population. So, are we are those cubs growing up to be adults that then contribute to the population with their own cubs? Um, if cubs aren't very healthy one year, if the mums aren't very healthy, we know that that's not great for the population if that's happening um, over long term. We've done a lot of reproductive studies because we have these long data sets. We, we know that mums back in the 80s were generally a bit bigger and had more cubs than they're doing right now. So it used to be that in Hudson Bay, we would see triplets uh, much more often than anywhere else in the polar bear world because Hudson Bay is quite productive. There's a lot of seals here, and there used to be good ice conditions, and the bears could eat a lot, and they were doing great. Um, but now what's happening is that because the ice has run less, the females aren't getting as much body fat as they used to, and so they just can't support as many cubs as they used to. And so now we rarely see triplets. Uh, we're seeing a lot more single cubs. We're still seeing twins. And we do know that there is a threshold of weight at which a polar bear needs to be at to get pregnant, just like in humans and other mammals. And we're seeing more and more, again, a long-term trend, but more females kind of getting a little bit smaller, maybe closer to that threshold. And we don't want that to happen. So moms and cubs are absolutely critical to our knowledge of a population. And of course, they're just so interesting to study. Mm -hmm. um, we also mm -hmm. collar, the, the bears that we collar generally are moms with cubs. So a lot of our movement data of where they go on Hudson Bay and our distribution knowledge of polar bears comes from mothers with cubs. And some of my research looked at that with moms and cubs. And, and we compared differences uh, in movements between moms that had cubs and moms that or and bears that didn't have cubs and then over time how those things might change so it's very interesting so we have uh, Patty Moo who posted this and I'm assuming Patty that you watch the uh, that that great polar bear cam that's out there and she says after watching for so long will we ever see bears eat <laughs> great question <laughs> <laughs> we don't know we have we see them uh, around the coast where we have in the last couple of days. We see them eating algae and, and things like that. I think there's been reports from previous years where polar bears have gotten seals that have made some poor life choices. <laughs> um, so <laughs> if they get stuck at low tide inshore, they're easy prey for, for polar bears. But a lot of that, uh, what what's happening or where a lot of the predation events are happening further out than we can get with an uh, explorer cam or or really you need to be up in a helicopter a lot of times to see where those predation events occur. I do a lot of work with uh, aerial photos that we fly over the Arctic to count whales and we'll see uh, blood spots where polar bears yeah. have, have yeah. taken uh, ring seals. Okay. But they're yeah. pretty spread out and yeah, it's a good day when you find one. Yeah. Like, well, Stefan, you talked a bit about um, the about the food that you even seen some polar bears eat here. And uh, Sea Bear Falls uh, posted a question: Are there any other potential new food sources other than seals that might help sustain the polar bears? Yeah, that's really interesting. And w there's been a lot of discussion about other um, other food sources. The one that I'm kind of interested in and looking at around Hudson's Bay 
is, and particularly around Churchill, is we also we have ring seals, but we also have harbor seals. So harbor seals come up in the estuary. They're not as well adapted to life in the ice. Um, but what we expect to see is more harbor seals as we get fewer ring seals. So there's been some speculation that maybe harbor seals might be able to take, uh, provide some of that source. But we don't think, based on the biology of harbor seals, that that's really going to be a, a suitable long-term source on a population level. So harbor seal pups don't gain as much weight. They're not ex as accessible as ring seal pups. Um, they're not going all the way out into the Hudson's Bay, so you know bears that are foraging in the middle of the Arctic might not be able to get harbor seals. So it's a really mm -hmm. complex kind of ecosystem to try and figure out what's going to happen if we lose a piece or or things start to change. Mm -hmm. um, and an ecosystem that I kind of like the way it is right now. I, I wouldn't want to see it change too much. And you know what, it brings up an interesting question because ladies and gentlemen, we are almost done for right now. And Elisa, I'd love to know what, what got you into studying this iconic? Um, as we have these young people who are potentially watching this in schools themselves and they're thinking of career paths and what they might do uh, in order to help make a difference. I mean, you are making a difference every day working with Polar Bears International. What, what brought you to where you are now? Sure, you know, I just always really loved animals and was so interested in, you know, how they live and what they're doing and then how to protect them. Because uh, the animals that are here right now, I don't want them to be negatively impacted by humans when there's so much good we could do. So I, you know, I worked really hard in school. I did a lot of jobs that involved animals. And eventually I made enough connections um, and had enough experience and I got a, a master's project at the University of Alberta working on polar bears. Mm. And I just felt so lucky to be able to you know, be a part of this amazing animal and contributing knowledge to uh, the world on what we know about it. And after getting a job with Polar Bears International, it's just been um, amazing to feel like you're contributing to something. You know, get just to have this as a job is is so incredible and I would just encourage anyone out there and especially any students if you're interested in science or wildlife you know really go after that and work hard and meet a lot of people and you know you can definitely make a difference absolutely absolutely ladies and gentlemen so we've talked a little bit about what uh, our, our icon, icon is we heard about what we can do later on uh, in terms of our lives but there are also some choices right now that can be made and we heard about the importance of the individual choices you make whether it's turning down that thermostat whether it's uh, driving your car less walking to school whatever it happens to be you have the power to make that impact and to save Canada is one of Canada's most precious uh, national icons and ladies and gentlemen and that is exactly the goal of Polar Bears International and that is to keep the polar bear in the Arctic always not tomorrow not just next week not even five or ten years down the road we want it here forever and so it's been important to remember that time remains for saving the polar bear and their sea ice habitat as we look out at the beautiful subarctic that's there on the bay of the of the um, of, of the Hudson Bay we want you to remember that you are a part of making this so first off thanks for the things you are already doing like lowering your thermostat riding your bike reducing your energy device time and increasing your outdoor time. Important second part on that one. Vote with your family's money dollars in support of companies that are to have that have a sustainable business plan and then vote at the ballot box for policy leaders who will help support ch climate change. These everyday actions will help add up to save our polar bears. But I know some of you are wondering what else can you do? First off, you can go online and by signing on to our petition for polar bears, which asks the world leaders to take action on climate change, then take the next step by pledging to additional energy savings actions. Register on the Project Polar Bear um, and develop a community project that helps reduce carbon dioxide in load in the atmosphere. Also, check out the links on our teacher resources for each webcast on the Tundra Connections page for more information and materials in your, la in your classroom. And some of our partners are also helping make this happen. Taking a Global has a ton of online resources as well for individuals and teachers. From their online mobile tool called Commit to Act, available for Android and iPhone, which allows you to track 
your actions while sharing them with your friends and your family. Each action, from having a meal that doesn't include meat, all the way to reducing and potentially even reusing all the time a reusable mug, can be recorded, tracked, and used to challenge your friends in the global community to make a difference. Listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. For example, in every household in the United States, if they switch from one light bulb to an energy star light bulb, we would save enough energy to light three million homes for a year. Isn't that incredible? Ladies and gentlemen, remember these actions can have a huge impact when they are scaled up and they are helping us to do exactly what PBI's mission is, which is keeping polar bears in the Arctic always. As we close today's conference, we want to send a special thank you to all those people who made this possible. Julene Reed, who's an Apple Distinguished Educator and PBI Education Advisory Council member who directs the PBI Tundra Connections program, and our platinum sponsors, Frontier North Tundra Buggy Adventure and Canada Goose. Support has also been provided by Pearls of the Planet, a project of Explore.org, a direct charitable activity of the Annenberg Foundation. We're also thankful to Telestream makers of Wirecast, Parks Canada, Discovery Education, the Centre for Global Education, and Taking It Global. Ladies and gentlemen, you are a part of all these things, and it's your actions that are going to help make a difference. It's your actions and your choices that are going to help keep polar bears in the Arctic, always. Thank you so very much for joining us today, and enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.